This is episode 79 of the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm speaking with Lisa Whalen. Lisa is a writer whose debut book, Stable Weight, a memoir of hunger, horses, and hope, was published by Hopewell Publications in 2021. Her writing has also appeared in An Introvert in an Extrovert World, The Simpsons' Beloved Springfield, Introvert Deer, and Adana, among other publications. Lisa has a PhD in post-secondary and adult education and an MA in creative and critical writing. She teaches composition, creative writing, literature, and journalism at North Hennepin Community College, where she was selected Minnesota College Faculty Association Educator of the Year in 2019. In her spare time, she is an equestrian and volunteer for the Animal Humane Society. Now, let's get into the interview. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade, and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I'm Carly Cade, and today I'm talking with Lisa Whalen. Welcome to the show, Lisa. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I am so excited to meet you and have you on the show, and we are going to be talking about your memoir, and it's a very brave memoir, the story that you're telling. But before we get into the good stuff about writing in your books, I always love to ask authors how their love affair with horses began. <laughs> yeah, well, I think some of my first awareness of horses started with a, a next door neighbor that I had when I was a small kid. She was she loved horses and neither of us had a lot of direct experience with them, but I think I kind of caught the bug from her. <laughs> and then when I was 12, I went to a, a one week horse camp. Um, that I just absolutely loved. And I was kind of surprised, I think, by how comfortable I felt with the horses because I didn't have any real life experience to fall back on. And then just because of, you know, I lived in a city um, and my parents couldn't really afford a lot of lessons and I didn't have access. So for most of my life, I was away from horses until I met a friend through work who is a lifelong horse owner and she did some training and things for a while and it reminded me how much I, I loved horses and the experience with them so one summer when I wasn't teaching I thought you know what just for fun this summer I'm going to take a few lessons and that was like nine or ten years ago and here I am now and I'm still riding every week and I I realized almost immediately I think that horses being around horses and interacting with them and riding just did something profound for me and it took me a while to figure out exactly what that was and why but I, I was hooked pretty much right away once I, I did that as an adult and I've kept it up ever since. Mm -hmm. And you're very active with horses now aren't you? I ride every week um, and I I've known the horses that are there that I ride for like 10 years now because they've mm -hmm. been there you know for for quite a long time too so I'd love to have my horse my own horse someday but I live in the inner city and we don't have any property or anything and just the way our jobs are set up I don't know that in the near future that would be realistic but someday I would love to have a horse of my own uh, I I believe you will I mean once a horse girl always a horse girl yeah. you, but you're experiencing the magic and here, here's to other people's horses right and horse friends and people who places where we can go and be active with horses and, and get our fill of that healing joy that they provide for us. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways to be with horses. You don't always have to own one. You can volunteer, you can, you know, take lessons, you can be with your horse friends. There's all sorts of ways. And you're a testament to that. Although we all wish we could keep them like in our spare bedroom or something, right? I know. You know? <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? I'd love to just have one out in the backyard, my <laughs> tiny postage stamp size yard here in the city. But yeah, I know I would love that. I, I do think sometimes, you know, being able to ride different horses all the time offers mm -hmm. a lot of unique benefits, but I do often think, wow, if I did have a horse of my own and we were always riding together or spending time and I was caring for them and we had this unique relationship, I, I often think that must be so powerful. I can't imagine the 
the relationship that must develop. Um, and I hope to, like I said, I hope to someday experience that. I believe you will for sure. But in the meantime, riding a variety of horses makes you a better horsewoman for sure, because each horse has its individual personality and quirks and things you have to work through. So when it's time for you to have your own, you'll just be that much better of a horsewoman and know how to kind of manage things. And the relationship will be even deeper, I believe. So I hope so. Yeah. You're setting yourself up for success down the road for sure. Uh, and you know, this is really interesting to me. So you have, and I love this because this is, we're talking about horses and riding. You have a PhD in post-secondary and adult education and an MA in creative and critical writing. Now yeah. you are like the perfect person to be on this podcast. Talk to us a little bit about your career as a professor in the courses you teach, because th this is really fascinating. Yeah, so I right now I teach at a community college in a suburb of Minneapolis, and um, I've been there for going on 12 years now. And one of the nice things about it is that I get to teach a pretty big variety of classes. So I teach a couple different literature classes. I don't, I, I tend to teach the more intro level ones because my background isn't heavily based in literature. And then I teach some creative writing classes, which are really fun. And then the, the, the straightforward comp, you know, first year writing courses, which I actually really love too. I know sometimes English teachers are like, oh, comp, you know, but mm -hmm. I actually love teaching research writing and, and essay writing. And then in the last couple of years, I've been able to add a couple of journalism classes because I have some background in journalism. And um, one of the most exciting things I've been able to do is develop a Hmong American literature course because we have a pretty significant Hmong population in the Twin Cities. And that's been one of my favorite favorite courses to teach, actually. I've learned so much from, from the students because a lot of Hmong students take it. It varies a little bit, but I teach a, about five classes each semester and that rotates. And typically we do get to choose or have some say in the courses that we teach. So that's nice too, the, to have that rotation and have some say in, who's, in what we teach and when we teach it. Yeah, I guess that's kind of my background. Before I went to this community college, I did teach for about six years at a private um, university that's near me here in St. Paul. Oh, wow. So I have to imagine having the background that you do and teaching the classes that you are currently teaching helps you with your own writing. I imagine it keeps you sharp. Do you find that that's the case? Yeah, I, I often tell my students that you know, it's a cliche, but I think it's a cliche for a reason that you don't really understand something until you have to teach it to someone else. Mm. And I have definitely found that to be true with writing. I had a lot of training in it through school and, and practice and trying to get things published on my own. But I, I grew, I think, tenfold in my understanding of writing and my practice of it once I started teaching it. Oh, that's incredible. Good for you. So it, it all kind of the path that you've chosen all sort of flows together from the horses to the teaching your career to the writing career. It all kind of comes together. That's special. It is. There is a ton of overlap. You wouldn't think so, but yeah, between riding horses and teaching and write, writing, all three really, they do inform each other in some really cool ways, which surprised me. I wasn't expecting that. Oh, tell us, how, how do they inform? Is, is, that, is, that, is that part of where we're going with talking about your book or is that something that just you bring to everyday life like a little nugget of, of gold? I do talk a little bit about it in my book toward the end because the book covers a period where most of it is sort of leading up to when I got into my teaching career. Mm -hmm. I And I tell my students this all the time. I, I tell them, don't worry if you don't know what you want your major to be or your career to be right now. In some ways, that can actually be a good thing because I didn't have a clue. And it took me quite a while to figure out what I wanted to do and some stumbling around. But I think there are some benefits to that as well in terms of just developing your breadth as a, as a human being and making you well-rounded. Yeah. One of the things that I, I was just talking with a friend, I take lessons with writing lessons with the other day. I think every teacher, especially in, as they get into their older years should do something that they're maybe not, that doesn't come naturally or that's new to them because, you know, for me, school came fairly easily. And I, for the most part, I liked school. I'm kind of a nerd. I like to study. I like research. I like learning things. And I'm a huge reader. But, you know, for a lot of my students, that's not necessarily the case. 
And so when I started as an adult in my 30s, basically brand new to riding horses and being around them, it was a huge eye-opening learning experience for me. Suddenly here was something that I had no experience with and I wasn't necessarily a natural. And unlike my career or other hobbies, I couldn't fall back on this lifetime of experience. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, sometimes it was frustrating and sometimes often I didn't get it the first time or even the third time. And I would think I had it down And then, you know, something would get added and it felt like I went back to step one (laughs) or it was different with a different horse. Right. So I I think for a teacher, it's invaluable getting that experience because it has increased my patience and my understanding and my empathy for students who struggle with my subject area, which is, you know, something that comes fairly easily or I probably wouldn't be teaching it. So that I think has been huge, but also just the the way that horses have taught me to and learning from them has impacted my teaching quite a bit. So there's a lot of overlap there, but then also just the, between writing and riding, both are what I, I learned through my education, this word called recursive, I'd never heard it before. But recursive is just this idea that in order to learn something, it's, it's circular. And so you may add nuance and you may add skill or you may add levels of difficulty but in a lot of ways it's really circular you have to keep coming back to it and relearning it um, or learning it better and that's so true of writing I think too and I've definitely found that to be the case with my horseback riding too oh wow that was that was a definitely a golden nugget of, (laughs) of advice there I love that and it's true it's true the more the more you write and the more you ride the better you get, but the fundamentals are essentially the same, but you keep improving the craft or improving, you know, upon, upon that passion or, you know, and it's, and it's a habit, it's a habitual thing too. You have to keep coming back and, and working on those things. I I love that. Thank you. And so speaking of writing, your writing has appeared in literary journals and several edited collections. But we're going to circle back to your book here because so you've been you have a full writing career. You've written a lot, uh, and I don't know if you want to touch on that really quick because I wanted to ask you. I mean, you've just released your very first yours uh, book. It's called Stable Weight: A Memoir of Hunger, Horses, and Hope. So you know, do, if you want to touch a little bit on your writing life prior to taking on a, a book of your own, I, I would love to hear a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah. Um, The funny thing is, uh, and um, this may touch on some of the other things you wanted to bring up too, but the funny thing is, is that I didn't know I was going to write a book. I didn't even know that's what I was doing until late into the process. My, most of my background and my specialty in school was creative nonfiction. So all of nonfiction, but then also like a lot of personal essay, reflective essay. Mm -hmm. And although I would love to write fiction and I do hope to still try it at some point, it just never felt like a natural fit for me. And so I started off doing some personal essays or research essays and getting those published. And that built my confidence a little bit. And then I, the book actually started with just a quick little free writing exercise that a friend and I did one day when we were meeting over the summer. And I was like, oh, hmm, there's something here. And I really didn't even have an idea of what to write about. So I just started writing in a a description of a recent lesson that I'd had with a horse called Penny. And uh, that descriptive exercise was, I was like, oh, I think I actually have an essay here. I'm going to work on this. And then I I started working on it and I was like, oh, this is a couple essays. Maybe I can get a few out of it. Mm -hmm. And then it became, well, this is too big. Maybe I'll do a collection of essays in book form. That would be really cool. And then I took it to my writing group a couple of different times and they were like, no, this is a book. I think you're writing a book. You should, you should, you know, go with that. I was like, oh, wow. Okay, cool. It's been, you know, rewritten in various forms a few different times. And I think that's probably why it reads a little bit like a hybrid almost of essay and narrative, which is a little unique and does, does not make it super easy to, to get published. I will, I will say, I don't necessarily recommend that for other writers. (laughs) So, uh, so, well, there's a lot to unpack there. So, you know, you, you brought up some things, we're going to discuss your 
publishing process here in, in a few minutes. Uh, but before we dive into your process, because you also mentioned writing groups, which I'd love to talk to you about too, and, and sort of your, uh, your writing style or structure and how you get words on the page because you are a professor of creative writing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but before we go there, tell us about Stable Weight, a memoir of hunger, horses, and hope, because I find this topic incredibly brave for you to take on and share uh, with others so they can learn from, from what you've experienced. So tell us a little bit about your book. Yeah, thank you. So Stable Weight is about how learning to ride horses in adulthood, uh, I, I, the way I put it is that it, it really was like a practicum for therapy and treatment that I had gone through a little earlier in my life. So starting in about halfway through high school, I started developing an eating disorder and along with that also some depression and it's kind of a chicken and egg thing neither I nor the people I've worked with in terms of treatment are really sure which was the cause and which was the effect and it could be a little of both but they went hand in hand and then I had this somewhat traumatic experience with a relationship in high school that just sent the whole thing spiraling and so I had a few fits and starts where I tried to get help when I was a teen and wasn't really taken seriously by medical professionals, although my parents and my family were incredibly supportive. And so I basically dealt with this off and on, this depression and eating disorder from high school through, I would say, like my early to mid 20s until I finally really almost reached a crisis point and was hospitalized just for a very short time for a few days. And so fortunately through that, I was lucky enough to get put in touch with something called the EMILY program, which is now a, a nationally recognized eating disorder treatment program, but it actually started here in St. Paul, Minnesota with just a couple people and it grew really quickly. And um, through the EMILY program, I've, I started to figure out what happened with the eating disorder, why it, why it functions the way it did, what I could do to, to fix it and get the depression treated. I did, I did go on a path where I'm taking medication for that, although that's not, you know, for everybody. And then when I started riding horses, everything about it just seemed to lend itself to practicing these things that were not easy for me as part of treatment. Perfectionism is something that I have been an extremely, I guess, saddled with, for lack of a better word, for most of my life. And I wasn't really even all that aware of it until I started the eating disorder treatment. And perfectionism is really common among people who struggle with eating disorders. And there's something about being with the horses and the way they force you to be in the present and stay in the present that really helped me with the focus on getting away from perfectionism. But then also just horses are so physical and they're so, all of their relationships are based on a lot of physical movement and energy. And so I really had to learn how to be in my body again and how mm. to be phys a physical being and how to develop relationships with other beings through my body and through physical interaction. And I had for so long just detached myself from my body and put it under the the auspice of my brain, you know, just saying, well, what my body tells me doesn't matter. You know, it's signals, it's feelings, it's urges, whatever don't matter. It's my brain is in charge mm -hmm. and horses don't function that way, certainly. And so there's a lot that they taught me about just re-entering my body and living in my body again, and learning that it doesn't have to be always a source of pain and stress and something to overcome. It can also be a source of pleasure because horseback riding was so fun and I had to be in my body and in the present to do it. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, that is such a powerful way to, to acknowledge and understand what, what's going on and, and to complement what you went through with treatment. I mean, just it just the fact that you brought this conversation into the open through your own experiences is really, really powerful and brave because this is something that, you know, a lot of people don't, aren't comfortable talking about depression and eating disorders or addiction, any of those things. And I think you're doing something really special and pulling that back and talking about it and sharing with people your experience. Now, you know, 
why, like what made you decide to really write this? I mean, the idea bubbled up, but I mean, this is, this is pretty personal. Why, why did you decide to share such a personal message in your memoir? Yeah, it took me a while to get to that point too. There were a lot of times early on when I was working on it where I thought, you know, I might not even ever show this to anyone, but mm. I'm getting so much out of writing it. Like I'm learning so much and healing so much and understanding things from writing it. So I'm just going to keep going. And there were times where once I started seriously considering that I might publish it, I thought, well, God, I don't know. Do I really want that out? You know, or do I want to tell people about this? Do I want to leave that in the book? And I just had to keep telling myself, write it, just mm -hmm. write it. You know, you can always take it out later. There'll be plenty of times to take it out before the book is even in the world. So just write it. It seems like it needs to be in there right now. And then worry about all that stuff later. Mm -hmm. Worry about how people will perceive you, what readers will think. That, that'll all come later. And so that's how I really approached writing the book and doing the revisions and all of that. And then I really took tiny baby steps to get it, to get to the point where I was comfortable with it. It started with the writing group, showing it to a few trusted readers uh, that I trusted both in terms of their writing advice, but also just emotionally and confidentially and all of that. And I think I expected a lot of judgment from people or, oh, wow, you know, just negative responses, but people were so compassionate and mm -hmm. empathetic. And the most common response I've gotten is, oh my gosh, yeah, I've dealt with that. Or my, my loved one has dealt with that or my friend. Um, and so the more I shared it, the actually the more affirming it became and the easier it was to be open about it. And I found the more open about it, I was the less of a grasp the the eating disorder and the depression had on me because it so much of an eating disorder is all about hiding and secrecy mm. and not being your authentic self. So it, it was very tiny incremental stages to get to a point where I was comfortable with it. And even when I knew the book was coming out and I was hoping to talk to people about it, I still had these little twinges every once in a while of panic, like, oh my God, am I really going to do this? But like I said, even those responses have been so positive and supportive. It's actually been a hugely positive experience. Oh, that's really wonderful to hear. And I, I really wanted to touch on something you said earlier. What, you shared it with people that you trust, not just their writing advice, but who they are emotionally and how they are confidentially. Because I think in the early beginnings of any project for any author, you know, your, yours is very personal. I mean, that, that's a big, you got to have a big, you know, stomach flip when you're going to publication, but we all experience that. But it's really important in the early stages of any writing that you're doing to share it with someone that you trust that is going to motivate you to keep going and really be honest, right? But also protect you at the same time, because writing is a very emotional pursuit. And if you share your work with the wrong person, it can shut you down. And this beautiful thing that you have now put into the world and are sharing with others that healed not only you, but could potentially help heal so many other people who are going through the same thing that you've dealt with, maybe couldn't have got there if you'd shared it with the wrong person. So, so yeah. you know, do, would you agree with that as a- Oh, professor? definitely, absolutely. There, there were many places along the way where if someone had said the wrong thing mm -hmm. or if I'd had the wrong person read it, it would have absolutely shut down the whole process. I was really lucky to have readers in my life who they would tell me the truth. I had one very close trusted friend late in the process tell me, mm, I think, I think you need to be a little more likable. And she was absolutely right. And that sounds harsh, but she was right. And in the early drafts, I was processing all this stuff and it was still kind of raw. And so there were places where I was, I guess I just think of it as like over the top mm. or um, it just wasn't polished and refined. And, and I, I didn't see that so much until I went back and looked at it through her eyes. Mm. So yeah, trusted readers are so important, I think for every writer. And often readers come up with stuff that I wouldn't have thought of where I'm like, oh yeah. In fact, the, the start of my book, the, the way the first prologue section came from some, an offhand comment that that friend who is um, a writer and a writer mm -hmm. had said. So she really helped with 
figuring out this problem with the structure that I had late, fairly late in the process. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's amazing the things, but be, because it's, it's a yours and you're writing. And when you spend a lot of time with the manuscript, you see, you see it an awful lot. So it helps to have the, the feedback of others to say, you know, soften it here, or, you know, maybe this would work better. Yeah. So, and, but trusted, always the trusted folks, but that that's wonderful. And it's good to have people like that in your corner. You know, you mentioned dealing with perfection. I think that a lot of women have to deal with, with perfection and, and, you know, just from seeing what we see on the cover of magazines to being, you know, taking care of everything in the household, behind the scenes, being mothers, being writers, trying to pursue a passion, having horses, like all these things, we're managing all these things. And then on top of it, we're trying to be perfect about all things that we're doing. What would you say to people that are, you know, kind of struggling a little with that? One of the most helpful things that I learned through therapy was this idea of all or nothing thinking. Mm. And I didn't realize that's a lot of what perfectionism is, right? Like I have to do something perfectly or I can't do it at all. And I didn't realize how much this all or nothing mindset just was like a thread through everything I did and how I saw the world and how, and how I thought about myself until I started seeing it through therapy. And so I think being able to recognize when you're falling into that all or nothing mindset is really helpful. And then also just, I had to, one of the hardest things to learn, and it sounds so obvious and so basic, but one of the hardest things for me to learn was just having some compassion for myself and some patience for myself and being kind. Mm. One of the, I, there's a chapter in the book about this actually, but one of the most valuable things therapy taught me was that I should think of myself and treat myself like my best friend. And there were so many things that I thought about myself or said to myself or said about myself that I would never say about anyone else. And they were so harsh. And so having that change of mindset and thinking about, well, would I do that to my best friend? Or would I say that about my best friend was really helpful in battling that perfectionism streak. Oh my goodness. I, that's really lovely. I mean, we are so hard on ourselves. We're our own worst critics. We say such awful things to ourselves. And I love what you said about granting grace and space and compassion for ourselves. And it is right so black and white when you're when you're thinking about these things it's like we there is a whole gray space in the middle that we can embrace and and be kind to ourselves i i love that and i'm so happy that you discovered that through therapy but then you wrote a chapter about this in the book where you can share that knowledge with other people yeah and it was funny that one of my very early horseback riding lessons the instructor said to me you're a perfectionist aren't you and I just had this reaction, like, you've known me for a couple of hours <laughs> in this very specific setting. How did you identify that? And she said, well, I am too. And we talked about that. And she said, look, horses aren't perfect and they don't care about being perfect. So even if you were perfect, it's your riding is never going to be perfect because the horse isn't. So they let you off the hook. Just chill out, you know, your, your riding's never going to be perfect and horseback riding's never going to be perfect. So just forget about that. And that was a huge weight off my shoulders. From that moment on, I was like, oh yeah, I'm never going to be perfect at riding. So, and the horse doesn't care. So I'm just going to let go of that. Mm. And what is perfect anyway, right? right? Like it is such a strange thing to think of perfect. Like, I don't know that anything is perfect mm -hmm. Th things are beautiful life is beautiful you know but perfect so yeah. that's a human created trap <laughs> very much very much so yeah <laughs> through one word one word can cause so much damage it's so crazy it, and I mean your memoir is just I think this is such a special contribution to humanity but also people in the horse space is there a, a message in your memoir that you really hope to leave readers with when they've finished reading your book? Yeah, I think it's two things. I would, I would go back to that idea of just having compassion and empathy for yourself. And I found that the more I was able to have that empathy and patience and compassion for myself, the easier it was 
to have for others too, whether they're human or horse or, you know, another kind of being. And I think the other thing is just recognizing the individual value and beauty of, of each individual being. The, riding so many different horses and sometimes riding a different horse every week for a month at a time really taught me a lot about being able to accept the weaknesses in other individuals as well as myself, because I certainly have plenty of unique weaknesses, but also to value the unique strengths and things that I loved about each of the horses as a individual. And so I think that is something I would hope that readers would take away from the book. Each chapter is named for one of the horses and then the, the gift or the life lesson that that horse taught me. So the, the, I tried to emphasize that idea in the book by devoting one chapter to each horse and to each lesson or idea. So letting go of being perfect is one of them. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the first horses that I met. His name was Buck. And uh, so that those are two things that I really hope readers take away from the book. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I, I love that you aligned it with with horses, but it's it's such a broader message. You know, it's like granting ourselves grace, granting others grace, appreciating beings, because that's what we all are. I mean, what I hear is a lot of love Mm -hmm. bubbling up in here, like self-love, but also love of others and in compassion and kindness to, to yourself and others, right? It's yeah. And it's, it tells me a lot as a teacher too, being able to, coming to riding horses as an adult, I think I still had this idea that, oh, you know, a horse is a horse and you climb on and you ride and that's, you know, it's all the same. And it was a, a bit of a shock to learn how different every single horse was in terms of strengths and weaknesses personality quirks and mm. even just their physical bodies every horse felt so different even among the same breed most of the horses I ride are thoroughbreds but there's a, a Morgan and some warm bloods too and that has really helped me with students too right like I don't see them as a class when I'm looking out at the room and as a uh, an instructor of writing I get to know them really well on a personal basis too which I'm lucky not not all instructors get that but it, it really helped me to see and I can remember that they're each individuals with unique experiences and unique lives and strengths and weaknesses. And I think that's made me a better teacher. So I have the horses to thank for that. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. You're looking out, not at a class, but a, a sea of individuals. That is so beautiful. And horses are the same. It really <laughs> takes something to create connection with other beings, right? Like you're, you have to get your energy in the right place and, and be with them. But it's like, I think you nailed it on the head. The first step is actually seeing, yeah, seeing them. I love that. Uh, now, get, getting a little bit into the writing of the memoir, uh, it, you know, you, you have touched on it quite a bit. Like it started as an idea and then you were thinking of doing essays and then, you know, you have a writing group. What, do, how do you structure your writing time? Like, because you are a teacher, you sound like you have a big class load, you, you ride, you know, how do you fit in time for your writing? Like, how do you get the words on the page? I wish I could say I was one of those writers who I set aside this much time every single morning and I sit down on my computer and I do it. <laughs> but it's just a terrible thing to say as a teacher of writing, but I'm not very disciplined about my writing. And I think this is true of a lot of things in my life. And that's part of why teaching adults works well for me. I tend to be a person who works well in intense bursts and when I'm in the right headspace. Mm -hmm. So with teaching, I tend to do that. Like if I'm in the right headspace, I can grade essays for hours at a time and do it really well. But if I'm not in the right headspace, I'm better off drafting emails or doing administrative work and letting those essays sit until I'm in the right headspace. And I'm very much that way as a writer too, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish it was different. I am fortunate in that I don't always teach over the summer, which mm -hmm. gives me some concentrated time. One of the best summers I had was when I wasn't teaching and I actually would get up in the morning, work on the book for several hours, go for a run or a walk over the lunch hour and come back and shower and eat and then go back to it for a little while. And that helped a lot that whole intensive summer. But during the school year, I try 
my, my goal is two days a week to set aside some time, usually in the morning, because I am a morning person, to sit down and write. I have found that trying to write in the afternoons or evenings does not work particularly well for me. Mm -hmm. So it is, for me, it is more almost emotional. It's more about the headspace that I'm in and being able to hear that internal voice than it is about having a regular practice. You know, and and each writer is different, right? And each way you get the words on the page is different. Like the routine is ideal, of course. Like but, you know, a lot of authors that I've talked to on the show write in bursts and they have, it like comes and then they go, you know, so it's, it's, it's smart to figure out what works for you. And I, you've identified what works for you. You've tried both ways and you embrace it when it comes and, you know, being in the right headspace, there's a lot to be said for that. And in knowing when you are there there's a lot to be said for that but in the interim do you carry like a journal around with you to like scribble notes if like little ideas pop up for you while you're while you're doing your your thing during the day I do I have a notebook that I carry around with me and it's nothing fancy it's just like a spiral bound Mm -hmm. notebook but I especially I keep it by my bed at night because even though I don't write at night often as I'm falling asleep or even as I'm just like reading before bed things will pop into my head. So I'll jot those down and then come back to them later. And there are times throughout the day where even just if I'm running uh, errands at the store, I'll hear somebody say something that's interesting or have an experience where I'm like, wow, that was weird. I feel like I need to think about that more. (laughs) And it goes in the notebook and then I come back to it later. So yeah, I, I have found that that's really helpful. And I do find there's a difference between handwriting and typing each has its advantage, but depending on the subject matter and the approach I want to take, sometimes I do one and sometimes I do the other, or I'll switch back and forth at at different stages of the process too. Yeah. I identify with so much that you just said there. I'm, I'm the kind of person that has to have the journal on the nightstand because ideas always come up. And if you don't write them down, I find that they just disappear. So they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so we're talking with a creative writing professor here, everybody. Get your journal and keep it by your desk. (laughs) And remember those weird things that happen when you're out and about in life. And you mentioned publishing. You mentioned having a little bit of a a challenge with the format that you decided on your memoir around publishing. So so which route did you go? Did you go independent independent publishing or did you go the traditional publishing route? I for the most part I went the traditional publishing route. I did pitched to agents and um, sent to some independent publishers. I knew when I was working on the late stages of my book, I knew that the structure I chose was going to be a challenge for publishing, but it just felt right to me. And it just, it felt, it kind of goes back to that recursive idea. The, The book is a little bit recursive in terms of its structure. And it felt like me, like the right fit for the content. And so I just stuck with it. And I was very fortunate to find a tiny little independent publisher who saw the book and recognized it for what it was and thought there was worth in it and was willing to take a chance on it. So I um, I actually ended up submitting through directly to them. I didn't go through an agent mm-hmm. and worked with them, which was really great. They're, they're small. So a lot of it was relationship based and I had a lot of trust right from the beginning because I got to know them and it wasn't just a process where I felt like I was sort of getting passed along, you know, in a lot of different stages. So that was a really great experience. That's wonderful. And then, so how did you just, de- what's the name of your publisher? And then how did you discover them? Did, did, did you just do some research and, and they felt like a good fit? The publisher is Hopewell Publications mm-hmm. and I ended up finding them through a friend. I happened to be at a party for the old university where I used to teach at just to see some old friends. And I was talking about it and I was at a point where I was getting kind of frustrated and dismayed because it just wasn't, it wasn't clicking with publishers. I just wasn't having a lot of luck getting traction. And one of the friends there said, Hey, I, I actually, love that premise. My daughter went through something similar. And I know this publisher that I think might actually be a good fit. Do you want me to put you in touch with them? And of course I was like, absolutely. Yes, please. And it, it took off from there. So I, for me, it was another one of those cliche things where it's 
being in the right place at the right time and who you know. So a lot of times, I, I would never have guessed this, but so much of publishing often comes down to relationships too mm-hmm. and having that trust or that relationship with people who know the industry. It was a huge learning curve for me just getting to that point because I didn't know anything about, I didn't even know you had to have an agent or you should pitch agents or that that was a whole industry and had its own formats and conventions. And so I had to learn all of that as I went and I like to learn. So that was fine with me, but I was like, oh man, I thought writing the book was hard. Now there's all this other stuff I got to figure out. Right. (laughs) (laughs) That is the truth of the matter. I mean, when you, when you become an author, you are actually starting a business and there's all this business stuff on the back end, whether you go the traditional publishing route or the, or the self-publishing route it, or, you know, go with a smaller, uh, small press. It's, there, you have to educate yourself and learn all the nuances that go on in the industry because, yeah, writing the book sometimes people say is the easiest part, you know, <laughs> after you've gotten the book written, then there's this other stuff, but it's always write the book first and then worry about everything else. So uh, what was it, what was it like working with them? I mean, did they, did they, you know, help you with the editor and cover design and, and that sort of thing? Like what, did, how did that work? because they're so small, they, they were fairly hands off, which I actually liked because in my job, I get to be pretty autonomous and I don't always like someone looking over my shoulder and telling me what to do. And this was such a, a passion project and a personal project. I think it would have been hard if I'd had an editor who said, Oh, I, you know, I think you need to cut this whole chunk and rewrite this. And, or Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard experiences from other authors where they had an editor who they felt like was trying to make the book something that it wasn't intended to be or make it a different book. Mm -hmm. And I was very lucky. My editor, he seemed to think that it was pretty clean and in pretty good shape and didn't need a lot of big changes, I think because I had rewritten it so many times. And so most of my work with him was just cleaning things up Mm -hmm. and there were some great things he pointed out in terms of continuity, some little details about, you know, this, I think we need to know that this is coming sooner in the book than we do. But a lot of that was just um, mostly just polishing and cleaning things up. And we worked back and forth online because the publisher is actually in New Jersey mm-hmm. and I'm in Minnesota. And then the, they don't have a, a cover design department or, or anybody in charge of that. I actually got to design the cover myself. And at first I was like, oh my God, are you kidding? I don't know anything about that. What am I going to do? But I started just doing some research and looking around and playing with images and actually designing the cover turned out to be one of the most fun parts. It turned out exactly what I what wanted it to be and what I loved. So I feel really good about it. Well, do you have it there with you? Can I you do. hold up the book? So yeah, we can... so this is the cover. Yeah. You can probably tell from my setting and my clothes that I have a bias for the colors that are on the on the <laughs> cover. Yeah, I, I liked this idea of just having a more of a conceptual cover. Um, the publisher in the early stages had said, yeah, why don't you, you know, find a high quality photo of you riding the horses and we'll put that on the cover. And I liked that idea, but it just didn't, something about it just didn't feel right for the book. I felt like even the book, though the book is about me, I wanted it to be for readers and mm-hmm. I wanted it to be something that they could take from and then run with. And I wanted it, so I wanted it to be more, I don't know what the word is, I guess, broader reaching and and I wanted it to be something where readers could picture themselves mm-hmm. on the cover so I liked that there was this image of the silhouette and readers could picture themselves mm-hmm. as this person rather than it just being me yeah and the horse is ju- for those who are just listening in the horse is jumping over a fork which yeah. <laughs> is which is I mean really aligns with you know the fact that you're talking about an eating disorder inside of this book and I think it's interesting that your your publisher was like go for it you know f- design your cover yourself so you had a lot of power and I think for, to say how you wanted your your book to to look and work and I think that that's that's the cool thing about working with a small press rather than a, a big 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 publisher when you work with a small press that you do have a lot more say on how you work together and how things turn out looking. And then with a small press, you don't have all the pressures that go into being 
a self-published author, or I like to call us indie authors, where you're doing everything yourself, because I imagine you probably didn't want to have to do everything yourself because you're so busy being a professor, I would imagine. Yeah, and I was so... I was so new to all of this, even though I teach writing and there was so much for me to learn that I was grateful to have the structure and the the background of a really knowledgeable publisher and an editor. And I did a ton of research, even just about how to do a book cover. I read a bunch of blogs and I have to say, writers are some of the most generous people (laughs) there. It's amazing what you can learn just by reading other writers' blogs and what they'll tell you about their experience and pitfalls to avoid. I was, I feel very fortunate to have learned from a lot of writers who went before me mm. and had great tips for what to do or not do in designing a cover or working with a publisher or even pitching to agents. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot, well, there's a lot of information out there, but it sounds like you did a lot of the right steps, which is just researching and educating yourself and making decisions that are right for you because they're, we are very fortunate in these times. There's a lot of different avenues that we can take as authors in our author career. Uh, so you have to just listen to others, read what others have done who have gone before you, and then pick the best route for you because there's a lot of opportunity and options now. So thank you for uh, showing us a little bit about what it was like publishing. Now let's talk about uh, marketing. So speaking of you know working with your publisher, uh, you know a, a lot of times authors still are responsible for a lot of their own marketing. So how has the publisher assisted you with getting the word out about your book? But then also, what what are your responsibilities? How are you reaching readers and and getting your message out about your memoir? Yeah, since my publisher is so small, um, and I know this is the, the case for even writers who work with huge publishers that are, you know, international, most of the marketing did fall to me. And I thought, because I'm such an introvert, I thought I was really going to dislike that. But once I started reading and learning about it, I actually kind of had a ball. It's a lot of fun. And I discovered all these like cool podcasts, like your podcast, or um, I went to a conference actually that was really helpful. And I just started writing down ideas that other writers had had um, for you know, check your little local community newspaper. And mm-hmm. they did a, a story about it, which was really fun. And there's a small public access TV station that does a nightly news broadcast that's just for these certain suburbs of the, the Twin Cities. And I pitched it to them and they were like, yeah, sure. We do stuff about your community college all the time. We'll do a story. So it was really very similar to the writing process. Actually, a lot of it was just brainstorming and thinking up a unique angle or a way that I could link my story to something that they did or a goal or a mission that they had and thinking of it in terms of cooperation, like how can we help each other Mm -hmm. was a lot of what it was. And, you know, as writers, we're always thinking of audience and purpose, right? I talk to my students until they're sick of it about audience and purpose. So that was so much of marketing I, I learned too. And I actually ended up having a lot of fun and I've met so many cool people learning the process of marketing the book. Wow, that's great, you know, because that's something that a lot of authors really don't like is the the marketing. But you, it, what I'm hearing is you're looking at it as how do I make this fun? How do I make this creative? How do I add value to the other people that I'm working with yeah. and sharing about my book? And that, that's a really great approach to it, you know, and again, it's like what you were saying earlier about teachers doing something that they've never done before or are uncomfortable with because it gives you a new perspective and a new view on things. And it can be fun. You know, once you get through the, the, you know, trials and tribulations of learning something, you know, it can be fun. Marketing can be fun. So I love that. And then you mentioned audience and purpose. Give us some words of wisdom for the authors listening into the show about how you view audience and purpose because you drill it into your students now drill it into us <laughs> yeah I I think a lot of what I learned about that was when I was looking to pitch to agents I had no idea how many pitches they get just on a daily basis even if they work for a small boutique agency and so I figured out well I really need to, I can't just blanket send a bunch of stuff because they 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 can pick those out in a heartbeat and they just don't even look at them. So a lot of it was just learning about the agency, whether it was a publisher or a, an agent firm, and then reading their bios and deciding, 
yeah, I, I have something that is my book or that I have in common with this person that fits with their angle or their interest, or they're looking to shore up this part of their practice. How can I draw a connection there? So it really was a huge process of learning how to tailor my message and portray my book without being misleading, Mm -hmm. portray my book as something that fits what they're looking for or fits their interest or uh, something that they maybe are looking to learn and expand on. And a lot of it was just tailoring my message to that. And, and th- that's been true with marketing too, just mm-hmm. figuring out how can I show that my book maybe has something to offer them and, and that they have something to offer me and, and coming up with that partnership. Mm-hmm. And what I'm hearing you do the work to establish relatedness with the people that you're reaching out to, not just your readers, but also you know, people in the media or through your marketing, you're, you're designing like a way to create connectiveness and, and that's relationship really when it comes down to it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I always felt like it, it's so kind of anyone, whether it's, a, you know, a podcast or a reporter for a little newspaper, it's so kind of them to be willing to even consider my proposal, much less agree to, to work with me on something. And so I, I just feel like I want to have something to offer them as well. And mm-hmm. so that was the approach I took. And for, for the most part, I think it, it does work well if you approach them and say, hey, I have something to offer you. Could we partner to get to, a, you know, to accomplish a goal that we both want to meet, even if they're different goals? I think if we did this, we could each meet our goal that way. And they tend to be pretty receptive to that. There have been a few where for whatever reason, it wasn't the match or the fit that I thought it was. And so I didn't hear back, but that's writing, right? You know, you get tons of rejection and you learn how to, how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And often it's not even about you. It may be lack of time or who knows what's going on on their side, but I really, really appreciated how you reached out to me and you found the connection. And I really got that you had listened to my podcast and you had spent a little bit of time getting to know who I am and what matters to me and how I work with my audience because that really resonates. And, and you took the time to share information with me so I could go and take a look at what you do and everything was there that I needed. And it was a no-brainer. It was so easy for me to say yes. Oh, so good. I'm so glad for, to hear that. <laughs> yeah. To, thank you for taking that little extra time and getting to know a little bit about me too, you know, before we work together. And I really yeah. appreciate that. And it makes it easier. You know, you had everything that I needed to know right there. <laughs> and so I didn't have to go looking or, and it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't land, it landed as friendly and it landed as collaborative. So, so thank you for taking that. Action. And then it does take extra time to do that. You could very easily send a blanket email to everyone on the planet, but you know, I get a lot of pitches from people that don't even write books about horses that want me to have them on their show about things that wouldn't apply even to the authors that write horse books that are listening to the show. So, you know, it's like, take your time to research who you're asking to do you a favor, really. (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. That's how I think of it. They are doing me a favor and it's a kindness. And, you know, even if you don't necessarily think of it that way, think of it as time saving on your own part too, right? Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. even if you're sending a blanket, um, email or pitch or whatever, you know, you, you're not going to get many responses if, if it's way off the mark or, so you're still spending time without result. Right. So I think you can even think of it in terms of, well, yeah, I'm saving myself some time and effort too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can have a standard blanket pitch. You can just rework it a little bit to apply to the people that you're reaching out to, you know, try yeah. and find their name. Don't say, Hey there, you know, like that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, that's great, great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, And then I love to, I'm really excited to ask you these questions, but I often ask this, uh, I ask this to all the authors that I have on the show, but from the perspective of a a writing professor, I mean, that's your mastery. What for you has been the hardest part about being an author? But then on the flip side, what's been the very best part of of completing your memoir and being an author? Yeah, I think... For me, they're almost the same thing, which sounds odd, but the hardest part for me, because the content is so personal and I am very much an introvert and I've always up to this point tended to be a pretty private person and I have to get to know someone pretty well before I will reveal anything. 
the hardest part for me, I think, as an author was just putting myself out there with the personal information in the book, but even just pitching to, um, agents or sending my stuff out or pitching an idea for a podcast or whatever, you know, it is, it does put you in a vulnerable state. You are making yourself vulnerable. And so that, that was really tough initially, but it did get much easier with practice. Mm -hmm. But that has also been one of the best things I think about being an author is the connections and relationships I've made and the, the notion that people respond to that vulnerability in, in positive ways. They appreciate it and they recognize it and they're willing to be vulnerable back with you. And that creates a lot of empathy, I think, all around. Um, like I said, I, early on when I was showing this to people and thinking, oh, they're gonna judge me or they're gonna have this perception of me. And I actually found that it was quite the opposite. It just makes things more pleasant for me in general. And so that's been one of the nice things about being an author is getting that, that acceptance and learning that things that I thought were a huge deal or a major character flaw, in fact, aren't. And most people are like, oh, yeah, I'm, you know, I, I'm sorry to hear that. I've, I've, I know of other people or I've struggled with that, too, mm -hmm. which normalized some of it for me. And the less of a big, huge deal it was, the easier it was to be open about it and the less power it had over my life. Oh, my goodness. Well, and I appreciate you being vulnerable on this podcast and sharing all that you have. I mean, I have gotten tremendous value from you telling your story and sharing what was there for you during your writing process. So I've gotten tremendous value. So so thank you so much. You know, we're all in this together. We're all humans. Right. And we suffer from so many things and we hold all that in. And I love that you share that it was cathartic to to, to let it out, even though it was scary. Yeah. <laughs> it was. And, you know, and one of the things I, I think I knew this before I became more open about it, but especially since having done that, one of the things I learned is how exhausting it is to try mm. to put up a front or to hide things or to be someone you're not or not be authentic. It's exhausting. It's, it's mentally and emotionally really fatiguing. And the more authentic I can be, the less resources I feel like I waste and the less time I waste, the less effort I waste. So that was a pleasant discovery as well. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. Yeah, there's so many lessons to learn in this in this conversation that we've had today. So thank you for sharing your knowledge and your experiences. I mean, but, but you have to go through that stuff, I think, to get to the place where you can actually realize this has been running me for, for this long. It's like, yeah. that, that was like part of your journey. And then now you're sharing your journey with others so they can learn from your experiences. That's really, really special. I wanted to ask you about this too. I thought this was really cool when I was galloping around your website and, and looking for um, information about you and then developing my questions. You volunteer for the American Humane Society. I, I do. I, yeah. Talk to us about the work that you do with them and how you got involved with the organization. I think this is like a cool, you know, another piece that you're adding on to the work that you're doing with your writing and your students and the horses. And now you're giving back to this organization. Yeah, I think it's tough to say definitively, but I think volunteering at the Humane Society was part of what got me interested in, in checking out horseback riding lessons too. It all started with this, this cat that I adopted when I first moved out and was on my own. I decided that I wanted a cat because we grew up with a family cat when I was a kid. And I adopted this cat from the Humane Society. And I went in, and this is so something that people say so often, but I went in with this idea in mind. I wanted a female cat. I wanted um, a certain age and I wanted a certain breed. And I came out with exactly the opposite. <laughs> um, but he was just the best being I think I've ever met. And his unconditional acceptance and just, you know, he, he thought I was the greatest thing in the world, no matter what I looked like or how much weight I gained or lost, or if I had a good day or a bad food day or whatever, that was so meaningful and huge for me that I wanted to learn more about what animals could offer and what I could offer them. So I started volunteering and most of my life, I was actually afraid of dogs and I really didn't like them at all. And once I started volunteering, I fell in love with dogs and I actually ended up 
switching roles. Initially, I helped out with cat adoptions and like answered questions, took care of the cats, helped with the adoption process. And then I moved over into dog walking, which was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Just walking dogs on my shifts. It was a blast. And then just seeing and hearing other people's stories too about special pets they'd had or seeing them click with an animal and then take it home. I just find it fascinating the the relationships and the psychology and the ways that animals accept and love and want to be in relationship with us. And that definitely fueled my interest in, in learning to ride horses. And I see a lot of parallels between what I saw and experienced at the shelter and then what I see and experience with training and riding and all those things at the horse riding lessons too. Thank you for, for doing that volunteer work and dog walking. That's great. That's exercise for you too. It's like <laughs> a no brainer. That's amazing. And, and they're so happy. They're like so excited to see you because they know you're coming to walk them. So <laughs> you walk in like a rock star, you know, they're so happy to see you and so excited. Yeah. That unconditional love is just so special. And I really love that it also uh, helped you have a relationship with dogs when you were scared of them before. So that, I mean, again, that's like taking something on that you're afraid of and just going with it. And, you know, there's a lot to be learned in just trying things on and, and going for it anyway. I mean, there's so much learning on the other side of that. So you're being bold and brave and <laughs> trying things and, and offering that to other people. I love that. So what's next uh for you like wh lisa what are you doing where, where another book in you what are you thinking i mean i know down the line there's a horse in your life but for now where are you heading <laughs> yeah i you know although it was hard and there were times i thought about giving up i enjoyed the process of writing a book and putting it out so much i definitely want to do it again i really want to try a novel and i've been playing around with that a little bit so i think that might be my next big undertaking. And then I am actually in the process right now of working with Cambridge Scholars Publishing on a collection. Mm. So I wrote a piece for it and I'm editing it and I'll do, I, they'll have me write the foreword for it, but it's called Narratives and Empathy in the Digital Age. And so I'm actually looking for authors to submit. So if any listeners want to submit, I'm looking for anything that has to do with empathy and narratives. And there's an official call for chapters on the Cambridge Scholars website, and it has my name on it. So if you're looking, feel free to do that, because it's pretty wide open in terms of the genre and the subject matter. But that's been really fun. And I ended up, of course, writing about animals. And my chapter is on how social media has helped to broaden the message about how animals are sentient beings and the ways that we can care for them and treat them and how um, shelters use social media to personalize and tell stories mm. and advocate. So that's the, that's the kind of immediate short-term project. And then, like I said, I hope to play around with maybe trying a novel at some point. Oh, I, I love it. So lots of writing in your future. And I love the, the, the part that you wrote for that book that, that, that shows the good side of social media, the good things that social media can do for, yeah. for our animal friends. Um, you know, cause there's a lot of negative about social media, yeah. but there certainly is a lot of good. And I'm glad you're highlighting that too. In a novel, is there going to be, a, <laughs> is there going to be a horse story in the novel or you're not sure I, yet? You know, I'm not sure. I had one idea and I started it and wrote some scenes and did a bunch of like exercises for world building and character building but then I just didn't it, it just didn't click it's not mm. going anywhere so I have a new idea and it's very very in the early stages like I just have this one idea I don't even have characters or anything so I love to bring a, a horse into it and that's <laughs> definitely been part of my thinking because I enjoyed writing about them so much mm -hmm. and they were so giving in terms of what they were able to help me generate as part of the creative process that I would for sure like to bring them in again. Oh, well, wonderful. Please do keep us updated on how that develops. But in the meantime, would you share with listeners where they can find more information about you and find your books? Yes. So I have a website, Lisa Whalen dot wix site and then backslash lisa whalen and i also i'm on a bunch of different social media platforms facebook twitter pinterest instagram and they're all at lisa irish whalen so you can find me on any of those and then my publisher is hopewell publications they sell my book but it's also on amazon you can find it on amazon as well 
Great. And I will link to all of those places in the show notes, along with pictures that Lisa has sent over for me. And I will put uh, that call to action in the bottom as well. So, you know, people could submit if they'd like to for, for your book project, your collection project. Lisa, thank you so, so much for sharing so much amazing information with us today and, and being so vulnerable and being so open about your story. I have really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much for the gift of your time. Oh, I've so enjoyed it too. It's been really fun. And I, I, I appreciate your podcast too. I was so happy when I found it and I've learned a ton from it as well. So it's been my pleasure and thank you for having me on. Oh my gosh. And thank you for being a listener. I appreciate it so much. I just, you know, my whole thing is authors unite and let's spotlight each other and let's lift each other up and let's get to know each other and share a love of courses and writing with each other. So, so thank you. It's a perfect match. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes. And make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle.